Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll get started in about a minute. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on winning strategies to engage communities in safe routes to school. We'll be looking at strategies in urban and rural communities and highlighting examples from coast to coast today. With that, let's go ahead and get started. A little bit about the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. We are a nonprofit organization that works to advance safe walking and bicycling to and from schools to improve the health and well being of kids of all races, income levels, and abilities, and to foster the creation of healthy communities for everyone. A little bit about what we do we improve quality of life for kids, families, and communities. We advance policy change at the federal, state, regional and local levels, we catalyze support for safe, healthy, active communities, and we share our deep expertise. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. To the left is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you'll see the presentation. To the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can raise your hand, ask questions, and select the audio mode you'll use. Your control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click the View menu and uncheck Auto Hide Control Panel. Two options for listening to us today. You can use your telephone or you can use your microphone and speakers. If you have sound problems with one selection, go ahead and try the other option. We'll do our best to field any issues. Just send us a message in the chat box. Even though you're muted, we want to hear your input. Use the questions box to ask speakers questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar. We'll try to answer if there's time at the end. After viewing today's presentation, you might want to view it again or send the link to some of your friends. If that's the case, you can do it for free by going to our website, saferoutespartnership.org, clicking on the resource tab heading, and clicking on webinars in the list on the left-hand side of the page. All past webinars are stored here for your viewing pleasure, and they're a great resource, so I urge you to visit this page. Okay, and now for our speakers, we have an excellent group here with us today. I'll share their bios before their presentation. So we're going to start off with Demi Espinoza. Demi serves as Safe Routes to School National Partnership's Senior Policy Manager for Southern California. Demi works to enhance regional transportation policies through technical assistance and engages community members on transportation equity and environmental justice issues within the Inland Empire and Orange County. She brings 11 years of policy advocacy and community engagement experience. Her prior work focused community-based organizations of color by elevating racial equity and environmental justice with the Coalition of Communities of Color in Portland, Oregon. She has also worked organizing community around LGBT rights with Equality California. Demi's current civic involvement includes serving on the board of directors for the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, as well as a community advisory board member for Kaiser Permanente Research Bank. All right, here you go, Demi. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon um, for the East Coast folks. 
Um, again, my name is Demi Espinosa, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a community engagement project um, I had the pleasure of working on um, called Muskoy's Sidewalks for Safety. And in it, we're going to talk a little bit about a temporary demonstration project planning um, process that we, we worked on. And so let's get started. There we go. Perfect. So um, this project, the Muskoi Sidewalks for Safety, included um, a high school advocacy group called SOAR IE, and, and it also included an elected official assembly member, Eloise, Ro uh, Eloise Gomez Reyes, and then Safe Routes to School. So here's a little bit of a picture kind of before and after. And this all started with SOAR IE, uh, which is just a group of high school students, community residents who got together and wanted to figure out and prioritize what they wanted to change about their community and their neighborhood. And they landed on the fact that um, traffic safety, particularly around schools, was such a big issue. So with speeding cars, um, not enough crosswalks, not enough sidewalks, a lot of students felt unsafe walking to and from school. Um, so this is a photo of us, us with Sorai and then the assembly member. And just to give you kind of background about Muskoi in general. So um, I work in San Bernardino County, uh, which is the largest county in the United States. Um, the Inland Empire encompasses Riverside County and San Bernardino. And the community that I worked with uh, named Muskoi is an unincorporated unincorporated area of San Bernardino, meaning they're not a city, so a lot of the resources they rely on come from the county itself. Um, and the population is mostly 82% um, Latinx, and then um, it is mostly uh, consisting of low income um, to medium income. And then uh, there is a really fascinating tool that um, California uses, and some of the, some folks on the webinar might be familiar with it, but it's called the Kellen virus screen. So the Kellen virus screen measures um, socioeconomic indicators um, and pollution indicators to give you kind of a profile. Um, and that is that is used so that we can help identify environmental justice communities. And we know safe routes to school programming, walking and biking is just one method for us to improve air quality. And so Kellen virus screen is a really important tool to get us to look at um, what the air quality needs are for particular communities. So for Muskoi, uh, their profile was really high, so 96 to 100. And so that's a zero out of 100, and 100 being the highest, most need uh, for air quality improvements. So just kind of a story uh, of us how, how we got together. Sorry, you came to assembly member um, Eloise Reyes and um, the partnership and said, you know, we really want to focus on two schools and improve walkability there. Um, so we held some community meetings um, with the two schools. So we worked with Vermont Elementary School and Muskoi Elementary School. We engaged parents, um, had meetings of, of what were the what were the most kind of improvements needed at that school. So we, we came across three different um, project um, improvements, which I'll get into. Um, but, you know, getting together was was one of the most important things that I saw uh, that we really needed to do first, getting all the parents and the students together to make a list of priorities. And we um, wanted to bring the county along as well, because, you know, as I said, they're unincorporated. So any kind of improvement, Safe Routes to School improvement needed to be done by the county. Um, and to give you some background on these two schools, there had been um, studies, Safe Routes to School studies, so there was a countywide plan. So we had some kind of initial um, initial groundwork that was was done a few years before. Um, and in our in our meetings with the parents and students, after we figured out what we wanted to see change for those two elementary schools, we were like, we know that we need to get buy-in from the county. And we, we figured out like that tactical urbanism strategy. So temporary demonstrations 
or the best way that we can get the county's buy-in to make some of these improvements permanent. Um, and then we worked with our local metropolitan or, uh, planning organization, which is SCAG, uh, Southern California Association of Governments. They had a local funding um, mechanism to give money to community-based organizations to do exactly that, temporary demonstrations. So this is a flyer um, of the event that we did and all of the partners that we brought together. Um, and then we wanted, we know that we wanted to use this as a feedback tool to engage the larger community about um, some of these projects and, and you know, whether they wanna see them permanent. And then we wanted to use that our end goal to, in order to make this permanent, um, California has a uh, active transportation uh, program. And that is a, a way that we can get um, investment into a community that has literally seen decades of disinvestment. Um, so, for our project, we engaged about 40 volunteers made of parents and students, and then uh, 10 staff. So we had about 50 people work on this. And the event, which took place over the summer, June 16th, we had about a, um, 100 folks come and provide input. So you're probably wondering, what were the tem temporary demonstration um, elements? So the first one we identified was um, artistic crosswalk. Uh, so an artistic crosswalk, you know, does two things. One, it provides the opportunity for communities to show their pride um, and, and really engage in a creative way for students to kind of draw um, different different designs. We had uh, for this crosswalk, we had a, we had several, we had three crosswalks, but this one they wanted to do something that, um, you know, connected to, to books that the, the kids were reading. Um, so the second thing that uh, artistic crosswalk does is makes the crosswalk a lot more visible for drivers to see. Um, the second project element that we did was a, a bulb out. So this allows us to narrow a, narrow a street so that drivers can actually see when there's uh, cyclists and pedestrians crossing. So you can see in the left photo, we had kids really um, be a part of the process, painting. Um, and then on the right photo, we designed um, the bulb out with some flowers and then we had these I don't know if you can see in the, the middle of that photo we had some lawn signs that told the driver slow down their students walking and the last element was bus shelter so um, quite a bit of Musquay residents um, either use transit or walk and bike and so we recognized that there wasn't a lot of bus shelters to protect them from um, the heat from the sun and to to be able to sit especially for families that have, um, you know, children and strollers and other things with them. So we built these, we got uh, some of the project elements donated, um, and then we got to paint them. And then there's that sign over there, Muscoy Sidewalks for Safety, again, alerting drivers that there's folks using the road. Our event day was amazing. So we had, um, we were able to, to get a lot of um, school board members on board by having meetings. Um, ahead of time, getting them kind of all together and saying that th this was going to be a feedback event. So you can see in the top right corner, there's a photo that we had in Spanish and English um, saying, you know, what are what are things that would make you want to walk in your community? So bus shelters, um, crosswalks, um, <clears throat> artistic crosswalks, more canopy, things like that. Um, our press conference, we had parents speak. Um, we had elected officials speak, community members in Spanish and English. We also had students speak, which was uh, um, probably the most moving testimony that we were able to get. Um, here's some more photos of artistic crosswalk. And when we put this down, we literally saw the changes instant, instantly. Cars were slowing down. And then lessons learned, you know, like I mentioned, we, we worked directly with the County Works, um, the San Bernardino County uh, public works department and there was a lot of barriers um, we had to have community meetings with them to lay out our priorities and um, it, if it wasn't honestly for the parents talking about their concerns there was no way that we could have gotten this done uh, we actually persuaded them to apply for permanent funding um, and we helped them write the uh, the grant application 
we use community members too to, to give testimony. So it was also a learning opportunity um, both ways. So community members got to, to really figure out the funding process. Um, and then, you know, last steps, this was a photo that we, um, we were able to do a presentation of our uh, engagement, uh, community engagement event at a Peds Count, which is a pedestrian friendly conference, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, in the middle right there is Angela. Um, she's an 11th grader. She provided testimony. Um, and then uh, to her left is her mom. They both were such great champions. It was such a pleasure to, to work with them. And then um, in the middle there is Assemblymember Reyes, and she was really critical in helping us open doors because oftentimes, you know, working with public agencies and, and getting them to kind of be involved with community is a little bit hard. So we were able to build a Safe Routes to School champion there. Um, another opportunity, um, our Air Resources Board provided funding for community engagement on air quality. So that was a bill that was passed uh, called AB 617. Um, and, you know, we wanted, we recognize that these are two moving pieces, environmental justice and safe routes to school. And we had an opportunity as we were talking about traffic safety to also talk about the intersecting uh, policy opportunities and really build off each other. So we saw this as a um, AB 617 was funding Muskoi uh, directly to do some community engagement um, events. And so we wanted to tag on and show how all of these um, policies interact. So that's something that we're really looking forward to is getting parents and students engaged in um, AB 617 implementation. Um, and then once again, the ATP application, we'll find out if we got funding in December. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we want to continually meaningfully engage parents, students, and stakeholders um, by hosting meetings at the, the schools themselves, hosting them in Spanish and English, providing, you know, ensuring that there is no uh, language barriers, access barriers, um, and really bringing community leadership in front. So they, uh, as we continue to have meetings there, um, I don't want to be the only one facilitating them. I want the students to take leadership and ownership of that. Um, and that's it. That's my um, contact information. And thank you very much, Hannah. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Demi, for sharing your work. Those are by far the most spectacular crosswalks I've ever seen. <laughs> OK, next up, we have Roger Paleo. He has more than 12 years of experience specializing in sustainable transportation and its relationship to urban forms, inclusive of pedestrian bicyclist behavior, access to transit, and street and urban design research and practice. He is KOA's leading outreach specialist, possessing excellent meeting and workshop facilitation skills, both in English and Spanish. He has been a key contributor in preparing studies that guide the growth and development of local and regional transportation infrastructures with the goal to provide a multimodal system that addresses both short and long-term needs. Under his guidance, his team has led and conducted over 220 walk audits and 90 community events throughout Southern California. Thank you, Roger. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to, uh, our, uh, my presentation is just to share our experience with um, working within uh, Southern California. So I think just to jump right in on, on the topic, I think having a diverse um, range of, of staff members plays a key role in um, making a successful outreach uh, campaign. So we have a lot of planners and engineers from different backgrounds and from uh, planning and, and engineering uh, to help engage the participants. So for the, my presentation, I have outlined four main components that I feel should be considered when you are beginning to develop your engaging approach. So for the, the first one would be community engagement, obviously. So through the projects I have worked on, developing a roadmap of what the community engagement will consist of, I feel is very important to the project. No matter how big or small the project may be, engaging the public, uh, schools, uh, the school administrators, community groups, parents, early on is, is important. We, uh, we all always develop an, an advisory committee to help uh, steer the approach that we are taking. 
Uh, this helps bring ownership to the project and also gets important stakeholders to the table and keeps everyone plugged into the project early on. Equally important is the branding and marketing material for the project. These are some of the examples that we have developed for previous projects. So depending on the community, it is important to provide communication material that is easily understandable and also available in uh, accessible formats and provided in alternative languages as appropriate. So given the strong and oral visual traditions in many communities, having material or logos that clearly identify the project is invaluable and provides an identity to the project. So every community is different and our approach we take sometimes varies. So for uh, for K-Way's LA Supervised School Project, as an, as an example, we are working in a very dense neighborhood. So this presents a unique opportunity for us to engage residents within the walking zone. For KOA's um, project, um, the schools have uh, very small um, areas to cover. So we focus on parties that that the school um, some of the improvements that that the school can can improve on. We notice that for the ALA Safe Ride to School project, uh, we have a lot of uh, walkers and bikers that that uh, travel to the school. So we want to engage those participants as much as possible. So our approach is since. Since there tends to be a high walking rate at uh, the urban schools, having a presence in the front was key to our approach. Uh, we stationed staff at school entrances, we passed out flyers, and engaged with parents and found that it was uh, critical in, in encouraging their, this, their participation. So this helped build rapport with the parents and also helped increase our participation numbers. In addition to stationing staff at school entrances, having staff to be proactive and approachable to parents also created a sense of trust with, with participants. <clears throat> so as parents walk their children to school, engage with them, we uh, always engage with them politely and, and respectfully so that they feel more comfortable interacting with staff and are more willing to provide input on the, on their traffic, uh, on the traffic and safety issues they may encounter. Uh, while walking or biking to school. Once interaction is established, then parents are more willing to participate in walk or bike audits. And lastly, for uh, under the urban setting, <clears throat> making an event out of the walk or bike audits will help uh, attract more parents. So for the city of LA, they have done a great job in building relationships with the LAPD, Los Angeles school police, traffic officers, LASD staff, and school administrators. So that walk and bike audits <clears throat> allow parents to voice their concerns to specific staff, but, but also learn from staff from those departments on methods, on methods they could use to solve some of the traffic safety and social economic safety issues around the schools. Since urban environments typically have multiple issues, having staff from various city departments makes uh, parents' participation more worthwhile. So for our experience regarding the rural, uh, rural communities, we take a different, <clears throat> different approach. These communities sometimes lack the basic infrastructure, so it comes down to what basic infrastructure is needed within their community. What we've seen is a lot of the, the school districts have large attendance boundaries so a lot of the conversations that we have with parents range from issues that they encounter at school bus stops or speeding along uh, roadways or, uh, and also basic infrastructure needs. Due to the larger attendance boundaries and rural conditions, schools have a relatively low walk and bike moral split sometimes. When, when you compare it to urban locations. So given these factors, it is imperative that, that we adjust to the local characteristics to engage in many, as many uh, parents as possible. 
Since there tends to be a wide variety of modes of travel, having a variety of options to engage parents, we found was critical. So we also station staff at school interested, pass out flyers and engage with parents as they either walk their child or pick them up. But also we started engaging with parents that were waiting for for their uh, child in their car. So th this way we were able to obtain valuable feedback. This helps um, us capture a variety of feedback from range from bus users, walkers, bike users, and parent drivers. In addition to adjusting our approach, interacting with um, infrastructure users we, we found was critical as well. Many school districts do not provide school bus service to older students, so they are having to walk, ride their bike, or take public transit. We have also found that the students, middle school and high school, um, can provide a lot of the feedback we need to come up with uh, improvements for the area. So engaging with them to collect the feedback needed is necessary to understand their concerns. A lot can be learned by just asking what issues they encounter on their walk home from school. And lastly, attending community events is another approach that we like to utilize. So th this helps engage local parents and community members. We try to attend local events where we know we will have an opportunity to speak with local residents, parents, community representatives, and local organizations. This, this allows us to speak to a more diverse population and also engage with harder reach groups such as young families, older community members, and minority groups. So depending on the community, always have staff to assist in communicating in other languages that may be spoken. If you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. I think we're moving on to our next presenter. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Roger. Yes, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the question box and we will um, do our best to answer all of them at the, at the end. Next, I'd like to introduce Corey Johnson. He is the DC Community Engagement Manager for Safe Routes to School National Partnership. She currently works with schools and families in Washington, DC to support Vision Zero initiatives. Corey uses her background in the arts and education to create transportation safety experience that are inclusive, empowering, engaging, and people-centered. Take it away, Corey. Hi, Hannah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. This is my first webinar, so thank you for joining me in my, in my webinar debut. So today I'm going to be talking about a project that I'm working on here in D.C. called Our Streets, Our Story. And it's centered on two communities um, here in D.C. One's called Ward 7, one is Ward 8. Um, collectively, they're known as um, East of the River because they're geographically separated from, um, from the rest of D.C. Um, by the Anacostia River. And um, as Hannah mentioned, my project is centered on um, on Vision Zero and the community and the mayor's Vision Zero um, Vision Zero initiatives. Um, so East Little River in DC, um, it's a beautiful area, lots of historic buildings, a lot of green space, um, beautiful views of the city. Um, it's a lovely place to work. Um, the people I work with are predominantly black um, and the school communities that I'm working in, I think between 98% to 100% of students get free introduced lunch. Um, so, you know, because I'm working in community experience systemic disinvestment, um, this is why our project is, is focused here, because oftentimes in these communities, um, the rates for serious injuries and traffic fatalities are, are much higher. So, um, yeah, so I get the pleasure of working in um, two lovely areas in, in D.C. Um, and I guess before I get started, I'll also mention that, um, you know, as as a black person working in a black community, um, there are some barriers um, that I might not face that I could possibly face if I were white working in a black community. So um, I think that it's important to acknowledge that, that some things that, that work for me might not work for somebody else just because I happen to look like the people who I work with. Um, but even still, there are other barriers that I might experience. You know, I didn't grow up in DC and DC um, natives are you know, like, 
really, really proud of being from DC and kind of look at outsiders with um, with some skepticism. So even just coming in as somebody who's, you know, grew up in Maryland um, is one barrier. And I also didn't really grow up in neighborhoods that have experienced systemic disinvestment. So some of the things that people in the communities I've, I've, I'm working in have experienced um, haven't necessarily been my experience. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't all, you know, connect with each other and 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 find ways to um to to build authentic relationships. So to get started, um, so when I was thinking about what to share today, I was reminded of this book that I read about 10 years ago called Quiet Leadership. And I read it um, when I was teaching in the Bronx. And that book really taught me a lot about asking the right questions and um and actively listening to people. And this really shaped the way that I kind of view, you know, my my work. So when I was thinking about sharing today, I was like, you know, what are what are the constant reminders that I tell myself when I'm working with um, working with different communities, and um, and what are some of the questions that I ask myself to really help you know connect with people and and build those authentic relationships. Um, so I kind of come up with like these four different things that I constantly have running through my mind <laughs> as I'm working with people, um, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So the four I guess mindsets that I'll be sharing um, that help me engage with diverse communities is to be curious be open, be a listener, and be authentic. And I guess we'll be talking a bit in more general terms because, you know, these, these mindsets, these reminders can apply to um, all kinds of work. Um, and also, to be honest, this project, um, because of lots of factors, has taken a little while to get off the ground. So we're still getting, we're just getting our events up and running. Um, so I'll share of, like a bit about some of the things that we've, that we've been working on and also talk a bit more generally about like my philosophy um, around engaging diverse communities. So we'll start out with the idea of being curious. Um, and you know, like, I feel like whenever I go into a community, I want to know as much as possible about where I'm working and who I'm working with, um, both in order to ground myself and also ground my work. You know, I kind of like want to do my homework on, on the area where I'm working so I don't roll in as the person who, you know, just doesn't know anything about where I'm working because that tells the people I'm working with that, you know, your neighborhood doesn't matter and your story doesn't matter. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that I know, you know, exactly where, where I'm working in and who I'm working with. So when I first started out on our streets, our story, um, you know, I spent the first few months just researching neighbor neighborhoods east of the river. So I went on walks, I talked to people, I went to local businesses, museums, parks, libraries, I walked along different heritage trails. Um, and that really just gave me a sense of, you know, of where I was, it gave me a sense of place, it gave me a sense of history. Um, and, you know, it, it gave me a nice foundation for um, for connecting with people who, who, who I was working with. Um, so a few of the questions that I kind of use to spark my curiosity, um, you know, things like I wonder, where am I geographically, historically, culturally? Who lives here? How did they get here? What are some stories I know about this community? What are some stories I don't know about this community? What does it mean for me to be working in this community? And um, you know, even that first phrase, I wonder, can be such a powerful, um, powerful tool in working with um, working with different communities. So there's this one street in a neighborhood in Ward 7 called Deanwood, and the road is called Sheriff Road. So one day I was walking around and I was like, I wonder what the name Sheriff Road means. Like, where did that come from? So I did a little bit of research and found out that um, the road is named after a slave owning family from the 1800s, um, the sheriff family, and they used to live on that, you know, on that piece of land. And so that's where the road name came from. Um, so just little things like that, just, you know, taking out your phone and Googling, where does the street name come from? Where, why is this park named, you know, Marvin Gay Park? Um, can, you know, just really help us understand um, where, where we're working and provide that historical context. Um, so my next, constant reminder or mindset is to be open. And being open is kind of like being curious, but I think it demands a little bit more of us. It asks us to, you know, open our hearts, open our minds and, and be open to experiencing new things. Um, so here are a few questions that I kind of ask myself um, uh, when I'm thinking about how to be open. So where can I find community stories? What can I discover today? Where can I find opportunities to get outside my comfort zone? And what am I nervous about? And the last question, what am I nervous about, is a really important one. So like for me going into this project, I was nervous about so many things. Um, I'm new to transportation. I'm not a DC native. I didn't want to be like another, you know, well-meaning nonprofit coming into a community. 
um, that you know didn't even necessarily ask for this project, even though people you know do care about traffic safety. Um, you know, so there are a lot of things that I was kind of grappling with, but I decided that it was important to really name what made me nervous about um, about starting this starting this project. And so I was actually able to turn the things that made me nervous into some interesting conversation starters, um, so I could start connecting with people. So over the summer, I did a few um, pop up bike clinics, pop up bike shops at uh, one of the local libraries. And so as I was out there, you know, doing tabling and talking to people, I would just ask, you know, as people are waiting to get their bikes fixed, you know, um, so I'm new to the biking world. What are some of the best places to bike around here? What's your favorite thing about biking? What would you change? And then, you know, from there, that would lead to other questions like, how long have you lived in this neighborhood? Neighborhood, what are some ways the neighborhood has changed? And people were always so excited to share something they were passionate about with me. And I loved hearing what they had to say. So even just like me acknowledging what I was nervous about and being open about it, and then turning that into an opportunity to engage with people um, was something that really, really worked for me. And um, I had some great conversations over the summer with people about all kinds of things. Um, so, so my nerves ended up working out, working out okay. Um, my next strategy or reminder is to be a listener. And this is something that's kind of comes naturally to me because I'd much rather listen to the talk. Like even getting ready for this webinar, I was like, I have to talk for how long? Like, <laughs> that's a long time. But um, I think that listening is really important. And um, I think that, you know, it's especially important that we, you know, provide opportunities for and actively seek out and listen to stories by people of color, uh, people with disabilities, people whose language, is, uh, first language is not English, um, people from all different marginalized groups. And, um, you know, we really have to help elevate and amplify diverse stories, um, whether that means having a person of color facilitate your meeting or helping to get some positive press for a neighborhood that might not normally get positive press. Um, so when I think about being a listener, I actually always start with one simple question that can really spark some meaningful connections. And that question is, what is your name and can you teach me how to pronounce it? And um, Again, this is something that tells people you're important. Your name is important enough for me to learn how to pronounce correctly. And I was actually talking about this idea with some friends of mine a few weeks ago. Um, one of them is Indian, um, moved to the States about 17 years ago. And the other one is a white woman from the South. And so my Indian friend and I were talking about the importance of asking questions as a way to get to know each other. And so my other friend who's white, she was saying, look, I'm totally on board with asking questions, super important. I have so many questions about different people and places, but as a white person, it can be kind of hard for me to ask questions because I don't want to offend someone. I don't want to make somebody feel bad. You know, even though I like genuinely want to connect with somebody, it can just be a little bit, a little bit difficult. And, you know, I've heard that a lot and I totally get where that fear comes from. And as a person of color, I understand where that frustration comes from when we're asked questions by white people. But I think that if we really want to, you know, um, authentically connect with each other and really develop a more equitable society that we have to find ways to to engage with each other. And a first step, a nice first step is just by learning each other's names. And it sounds so basic, but um, but it can be really powerful. And, you know, my friend from India brought up a really good point. She was saying, like, just because I'm Indian, I don't know about every single culture in the world. So when I work with my students from El Salvador, you know, I have them teach me their names and then I teach them my name. So like we're we're all learners. Um, nobody is an expert on this. Um, and sometimes it can be awkward. It's not easy. Sometimes we say stay, say stupid things. But, um, you know, it's it's still something that's, that's really important that we need to be mindful of. Um, so I guess, you know, like to white people who are worried about asking questions, I mean, I'd say ask them, even if you're only doing it inside your head first, and then kind of like read the situation and see um, if there might be somebody else who's, opening to who's open to answering your question. Um, and for people of color, like as annoying and as frustrating as it might be to answer these questions over and over and over again, um, that's kind of work that we also have to do as well. So so we're, we're all on this boat together um, and, you know, starting out with somebody's name is a, is a great way to, um, to start building relationships. Um, other questions to help us be better listeners, tell me about, can you show me, what are you most proud of, what do you love about your community, what would you change about your community? And um, a really easy way to do this actually is to get a piece of butcher paper and some markers and just write your question on the paper and then have people write their responses down. So these are photos from two events. One is an after-school enrichment fair 
at a middle school in DC and the other one is from a walk to school day event in DC. And I just had a piece of paper on a table, some markers, and I asked a question. Um, one question was, tell me what you love about your community, what would you change? And then for the other one, I asked kids to write down, um, leave a nice message for somebody in their community who keeps them safe as they're walking to school. So a crossing guard, grandma, grandpa, um, a neighbor. And that's just like a nice, really fun, low risk way for people to share their stories, share their ideas, and for you to also learn about who it is that you're that you're working with. Um, even asking a question like share the name, share the story behind your name can be a great way to like learn somebody's name um, and learn how to pronounce it. So, you know, at your next meeting or next event, um, just pulling out some butcher paper and some markers um, can really do uh, make a world of difference. And get the slide to move and um so my last strategy um or reminder is um just to be authentic and this might be the biggest one um for me i think that you know people can kind of tell when you're putting on a show they can tell when you're faking it um so you know being authentic and and giving people opportunities to genuinely connect with you is um is something that's really important and again kind of lays that foundation um for the work that you'll eventually be doing with people so um, some questions that I ask myself um, when I'm trying to think about authenticity is, why am I here? What stories do I carry? What are the places and people in this community that connect to my interest? Um, what stories does this community wanna share? And how can I help this community share its stories? And one really fun question is, where are the people and places in this community that connect to my interests? So I love art, I love museums, I love reading. And so some of my first stops around um, Ward 7 and Ward 8 in DC where I'm working um, were to, you know, uh, art galleries and museums and, and libraries. And those places don't necessarily have to do directly with transportation. But again, it's about um, grounding yourself in, in, in the place where you're working, getting to actually know people. Um, and I had some amazing conversations with like museum security guards and librarians and an 80 year old museum docent who was telling me all about, you know, the neighborhood back in the, you know, 50s and 60s. Um, so again, it's just giving me a chance to, you know, connect with somebody authentically and um, and learn a bit more about where I'm working um, you know so whether you're into golf or yoga or knitting or going to the gym listening to music whatever it is um, you know finding those people in those places in the communities where you're working um, that that are relevant to your interests can be a nice first step in really um, grounding your work and connecting with other people and I really think that that's what it's all about just establishing authentic connections and um, and sharing stories and I think that when you have that solid foundation built and we're always building it it's you know a work work in constant progress um, that's when we can really um, you know connect with people and, and move whatever our specific agenda is forward because people, you know, kind of know who we are and, you know, we have a rapport with each other. So if we do have a community meeting or an event, then, you know, people want to come out and see you because they know, you know, they know who you are. They know that you care about their story and their community. And so they'll be more willing to kind of jump in and, and engage with what you're doing. So that is all that I have to share today. Um, thanks for listening. And again, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to ask in the comment box. Thanks. Thank you, Corey, for sharing your thoughts and process with us. And congratulations on your on your first webinar. You are a natural. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. So we are going to go through now and um, look at the questions that we got. We got we have we have a few. Feel free to add any um, if you haven't submitted your questions yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first question, um, and this is for, for anyone. How do you find the time to do community outreach when you're working with grant timelines and restrictions? I can go, this is Corey. Um, so it's hard because you know, like you, you kind of, you have to make time and it's a lot of time that we that we don't have. And um, the way that I kind of looked at it, and this is also kind of getting to like, you know, like the way that funders view, um, you know, view community engagement. But I, I think that, 
you know, this is all a part of the work. So if we're writing a grant proposal or a grant report, you know, being able to say, um, you know, I, I spent time, you know, researching the community and getting to know people and that this is a valuable use of my time because, you know, people's lived experiences, that's just another form of, it's another form of data and it's it's essential to the work that we're doing. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of made it like a non-negotiable, like this is what I, you know, this is what I have to do and it's an important part of the project. And um, I think that, you know, being able to find language to explain that and to kind of change the mindset around um, more of the qualitative data that we're collecting um, or kind of change the mindset around what, what our work looks like. You know, sometimes it's not sitting in front of a computer all the time or planning a large event. Sometimes it's having a conversation with someone. Um, I, I think that it's a that's it's an important first step in really elevating um, what community engagement work looks like. Um, and this is Demi. I, I completely agree with um, Corey. I, I feel like with the example of Muskoi, we were on a very accelerated timeline. Um, and so, you know, the county had their timeline with their application and then we had a community process. Um, and so what, what I did to kind of like balance that out is we did, you know, as many meetings that we could um, on site with the schools. Uh, we did conference calls and then really making them um, the communities that I worked with a part of the pro the grant process itself. So they have ownership of it. Um, and, you know, we had uh, multiple folks working on on some of the grant deadlines we worked with. And I think, you know, the county saw what um, what it was to really have a process that included neighborhood folks. And so, um, you know, that really worked in our favor to be able to have like a team working on things and, um, you know, really having ownership. Wonderful. Thanks, Demi and Corey. Okay, I have another question here for, for anyone who wants to chime in. Do you recommend different approaches for projects where consultants set up the events or do most of the ana analysis? I'll take this one. Uh, this is Roger. So for uh, on the private side of the consultants, we always have different approaches uh, depending on their community. Um, so I think it's it's equally important to to consider the community that you're that you're working um, in. Um, so developing a plan that 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 uh, implements with the consultant is is important. So, for example, if if we go into community developing a community engagement plan, um, this way uh, the all levels of uh, participation is is uh, included with for for the project. Thank you, Roger. Okay, another. I have another question here um, for anyone who wants to answer it. I'm finding that everyone is asking for community engagement. However, a lot of people don't know how to go about doing it. Have, has anyone been officially trained in community engagement and outreach? If so, where and what was the organization that did the training? Mm -hmm. I was never officially trained in community outreach and engagement, um, but I feel like I mean I feel like I've had a lot of different like jobs in different communities, so some of it's just kind of been you know like training, uh, you know training by doing the work. Um, but um, there's actually there's this one group that I really like. Um, I, it's actually it wasn't a community outreach training; it was a training on creative facilitation techniques. Um, I do have facilitated a lot of workshops since I went to this training a few years ago. Um, the group is called, I think it's called pa Partners for Youth Empowerment. I'll, I'll find it and send it to you, Hannah. Um, but it, it was basically about, you know, how to be an authentic facilitator and um, gave like all these different creative techniques for, you know, um, enhancing your workshops and again, allowing for opportunities to connect with people and people to share their stories. And it was one of the um, most interesting and best trainings I've ever, I've ever been a part of. So it wasn't community engagement focused, but still very relevant to this work because 
was all about facilitation. Um, so Hannah, I'll send you the link to it um, if I can find it. But um, yeah, sometimes it's just, you know, just, you know, doing the work or finding people who um, who you think are really great and engaged in the community and working with them, um, going to some of their events, attending other people's events is also a really good idea. So like I attend non-transportation events all the time, whether it's an art show or a farmer's market um, and just, yeah, just seeing what works um, by by being on the ground and, and, and learning, um, yeah, just learning from being there. Um, I agree. I, I actually, this is Demi, I, I haven't had a, like a formal training on this. I think things I've um, just picked up on on um, different jobs and I agree. Um, it is so critical to even just be a part of another community engagement process. Like I've, um, you know, I've, I've been a resident of, of Inland Empire. And so I've been through a couple of different like county led, city led, or even community based organization. And then you kind of, learn different styles. And because every uh, community is different, you know, you learn um, a little bit about what works in one community, might not in others, like urban and rural, which we talked a little bit about. Um, and I think the important thing to, to uh, remember, and I, I didn't um, stress this enough in my presentation, is the debrief. I think um, working with uh, your fellow facilitators about what worked and what didn't is so important to be able to improve next time. Um, so maybe, you know, you had a, commu a community engagement fail and, you know, you didn't have provide this particular service or, you know, that is all important to document um, and put that in your next community engagement plan and tell you uh, learning what works for different communities different times. It's all uh, part of the learning process. Thank you. Okay, next, next question. I'm lucky enough to live and work in a school district that is truly diverse racially and socioeconomically. However, this makes outreach difficult because folks are dealing with such different issues and coming from such different perspectives. Any advice for engaging with districts where the demographics aren't monolithic? Mm -hmm. I can go. <laughs> this is Corey. Um, yeah, so this actually kind of reminds me of um, of where I grew up in uh, in Howard County, Maryland, outside of Baltimore. Um, so, I mean, again, it's kind of, you know, you're it's kind of hard to be, you know, all, all things to all people. And, you know, I think maybe even starting with some um, just some opportunities for people to, you know, gather together. Um, around something that, you know, it might not even be a transportation thing. Um, it might just be, you know, a, a family, you know, family paint night or movie night or something just to bring people together, um, just to get to know each other. And then again, like once that foundation's built, then you kind of start, you know, delving into different people's, different people's, um, you know, direct concerns. But I think that any opportunity to bring people together in, um, you know, a general positive way, again, even if it's not a transportation event at first, um, it's kind of like a nice first step into, um, you know, into kind of like breaking down some of those barriers and being able to address people's, people's specific 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 needs um, but it's hard and it's something that I constantly <laughs> constantly think about and, and I'm trying to work on too um, yeah and I've just found any opportunities to you know bring people together and 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 connect with people um, opportunities for people to share their stories um, and hear other people's stories I think is really important as well um, art food and sports um, are all great ways to do this. Again, not necessarily transportation related, but I think that that's okay at first um, because it's really about, you know, kind of making those connections in the beginning and then kind of moving more into, you know, into um, into people's direct, direct concerns. Thanks, Corey. I have a question here for Demi. Um, in Moscow, did the did you assemble or install the temporary elements before the event day or on the event day? And how long did you have to gather feedback for that? Sure. So um, we built uh, all the bus shelters, um, 
you know, design the crosswalks um, and, and the bull belts. Uh, the day, actually two days before, we were um, able to do that on site with the schools. And then the actual, um, you know, installation was the, the morning of. And, um, you know, we, we decided the exact areas that we wanted to do that prior. So we had community meetings about where are these gonna be, um, have the most impact, um, where are the hot spots where students are crossing. So we actually, it took um, weeks, a couple of weeks to prepare because we did also some walk and bike counts ahead of time and um, did some observations, did some um, analysis of those observations. And so we had a plan of like, okay, we're gonna create these and then install them um, based on um, priorities from the community members where they, you know, they identified and, um, you know, where we made some observations of it. So it was a, it was a pretty big team. I was shocked the day when um, <laughs> we had like 40 people come out and um, I, you know, we were really excited. So then we did the press event and, and also planned that, um, did a tour. Our feedback, um, we did feedback a couple different ways. We did like a paper survey and then we did those stickers, which the kids loved. Um, and then we did some um, interviews as well. And we all we were able to use that for the application. Great, thanks so much, Demi. Okay, I have another question that can be for Demi or anyone else that wants to chime in. Um, community members have expressed concerns about increasing homelessness and gang activity on school routes. I was wondering if infrastructure improvements help address those types of safety concerns. If not, how do we address these issues? Any thoughts or advice would be much appreciated. Um, I think with the, and this is Demi, with the Musque example, uh, it was identified um, that community members were concerned about um, crime and wanting to figure out like crime prevention. Also littering was a big issue, um, like cigarette butts and um, things like that. So for us, we engage groups that work on those issues so that um, we could connect those parents. Um, you know, I think with the infrastructure uh, issues, whether they address them directly, um, you know, ours was a temporary demonstration. So uh, I think, you know, if this was hopefully a permanent one, we'd be able to engage community-based organizations that work on things like, um, you know, affordable housing or homelessness issues and really um, make sure that, you know, we're addressing everybody's concerns in a way that's like intersectional, like with environmental justice was a big one for us too. Um, how can we work with um, agencies that are implementing um, policies that affect environmental justice issues and like connecting those dots? So I think it's about having the right people in the room. Um, if, if parents bring up issues that are a little bit outside of um, safe routes to school. This is Roger. So for our LA Safe Route to School, that um, concern was is, is always mentioned at the walk audit. So what we've done is we invited the, um, the proper stakeholders at the meetings. This way, the parents can ex express those concerns, and the um, the stakeholders, meaning LAPD, the um, Community Services Department, um, they're able to take all that feedback and give them. The, the opportunity to call in um, those concerns. What uh, they've done is they have that uh, 311 app, and if the, the parents um, call in or upload their concern and put um, within their comment LAC Project School, then that elevates the priority of that concern. Thank you, Roger and Demi. I have a question here. What do you do if a city wants to exclude community members? I know this seems strange, but it is happening in my city. Does anyone have advice? Hmm, this is Corey. I mean, I guess I'd, I guess it might be easier to answer the question if I knew why, or maybe the, maybe the person asking doesn't know, um, doesn't know why. I mean, I even, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, I guess my first step would be to ask, you know, to ask why and then build the conversation from there. Um, and again, you know, 
um, like I mean, I was talking earlier about, you know, asking the right questions, even starting, you know, asking the right questions to get to the deeper issue of, you know, why you wouldn't want community members to be involved. Because there, you know, there's clearly something that's, you know, that's going on that's, um, you know, that that's kind of contributing to that, um, to that mindset. And um, yeah, I almost feel like I just need more, <laughs> more information to to answer accurately. But a first step would try would be to try to figure out why, um, and to also maybe see if there are other groups that have engaged, you know, community members successfully, and you know, bring back some, um, you know, some some concrete examples of of why this is important and why it's um, and why it's helpful. Um, but yeah, I'd first kind of start trying to get to the root of what the actual issue is. Great advice. Thanks, Corey. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our speakers and everyone who attended the webinar. We'll be sending you a quick survey and would love to hear your feedback on today's webinar. And just um, a little reminder to look for the registration link in our following email for the November 13th webinar, and there's also a November 15th webinar. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.